of your service folder. He's got the whole world in his hand. He's 
got the little bitty baby in his hands. He's got the whole world in his hands. He's got you and me, brother, in his hands. He's got you and me, sister, in his Please stand on page two of our worship folder for the morning praise. O Lord, open my lips. Hasten to save me, O God. to God, our light and our life. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. You are a great and a wondrous God, cupping in your hands all the depths of earth. You made the hills and the mountains high. You made the seas and the dry land. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. Come, let us worship and bow low. Kneel before the one who has made us all. You are the God whom we call our are the flock that you shepherd. Come, oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Let us shout with joy to our saving rock. Come, enter in with our songs of praise. Come, enter in with thanksgiving. Please be seated. Our first lesson is from Genesis chapter 18, and we have the Lord speaking about Abraham as a dad and about how he should direct his children in the way of the Lord. Then the Lord said, Shall I hide from Abraham what I am about to do? Abraham will surely become a great and powerful nation. And all nations on earth will be blessed through him, for I have chosen him so that he will direct his children and his household after him to keep the way of the Lord by doing what is right and just, so that the Lord will bring about for Abraham what he has promised him. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. This is song is a little prayer for mothers and fathers. We'll sing it three times, so by the third time, hope you can. Join in. Every 
Our second lesson is from St. Paul writing to the Christians of Ephesus, Ephesians chapter 6, speaking to children and then to their fathers. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with the promise so that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy long life on the earth. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. We sing together, Born and Cry, pages four and five in the service folder. Thank you. 
for the words of our Lord Jesus. We hear Jesus speak highly of the fourth commandment to honor father and mother in Matthew chapter 15, the first nine verses. Then some Pharisees and teachers of the law came to Jesus from Jerusalem and asked, why do your disciples break the tradition of the elders? They don't wash their hands before they eat. Jesus replied, and why do you break the command of God for the sake of your tradition? For God said, honor your father and mother. And anyone who curses their father or mother is to be put to death but you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father or mother is devoted to God, then they are not to honor their father or mother with it. Thus, you nullify the word of God for the sake of your tradition, you hypocrites. Isaiah was right when he prophesied about you these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. This is God's word. Amen. Amen. Give thanks to the Lord. Call on his name. Make known among the nations what he has done. Please be seated for the hymn. Thank you.
Psalm 112, praise the Lord. Blessed are those who fear the Lord, who find great delight in his commands. Their children will be mighty in the land. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches are in their houses and their righteousness endures forever. Even in darkness, light dawns for the upright, for those who are gracious and compassionate and righteous. Good will come to those who are generous and lend freely, who conduct their affairs with justice. Surely the righteous will never be shaken. They will be remembered forever. They will have no fear of bad news. Their hearts are steadfast, trusting in the Lord. Their hearts are secure. They will have no fear. In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor. Their righteousness endures forever. Their horn will be lifted high in honor. The wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away the longings of the wicked will come to nothing. My dear Garden Homes family, that's a big promise, huh? They will have no fear of bad news, right? <laughs> no fear of bad news. That's huge, right? This Psalm, Psalm 112, is saying, be this kind of godly man, be this kind of dad, and your children will be mighty, right? They will be blessed. And whatever bad news comes, whatever it may be, whatever bad news ever comes, you don't have to be afraid of it. Because the, the great I am, your God, is going to give this kind of dad such a steadfast heart, such a secure and fearless heart just like that. And we see that kind of thing in the Bible, right, where, where, where somebody has some really bad news and yet God gets them through. Or you think about Daniel's bad news, you're going to be in the lion's den. You think about Jeremiah's bad news, Jerusalem and the holy temple is going to be destroyed and you're going to have to live and see it. We think about Job's bad news. All your wealth is gone and your 10 children have died this day. And yet that faithful, loving, I am, he got those guys through it. He stayed with them. He kept them trusting in him, kept them praying to him, even praising him. Blessed be the name of the Lord, says Job. It's the kind of God we have. Whatever bad news comes, we can say if God is for us, who can be against us? Because God, my God, he's going to turn it all somehow into good. Whatever bad news comes, I don't need to be afraid of it. Big promise, huge promise here in Psalm 112. And yet, personally, it's not really the promise that I want, <laughs> I don't really want this promise. I don't, I don't really want God to say, hey, when the bad news comes, don't, you don't have to be afraid. No, I want to say to God, just don't send the bad news. Just don't send it. And then you won't have to worry about keeping me from being afraid. Just don't send it. And maybe the first time you read Psalm 112, maybe you could get the impression... That's what God is promising. A life that's free from troubles if you just live this certain way. 
I mean, almost the first word of the psalm is blessed. The whole psalm is about how to be blessed. Here is the kind of dad who is blessed, and his children are mighty and blessed, and and I'm going to fill that house with wealth and riches, and your righteousness will endure forever, and your triumph over your foes, and you will be lifted up to great high honor. Sounds like uh, peaches and cream, and easy street, doesn't it? Sounds good. And then, and then you kind of read a little more closely. And you see there's some challenges. There's some struggles. Can we, can we look through some of the lines of Psalm 112? Right? The children of this kind of dad, they will be mighty in the land. Well, you don't have to worry about me being mighty unless you're going to have to fight some big battles, do you? And then it says, even in darkness, light dawns for the upright. In other words, there's going to be times when it gets so dark, even one ray of hope, one ray of light is going to seem like a miracle. And he says, this, this is how you got to be. You got to be gracious and compassionate and righteous. Well, what's that saying? Well, if you got to be gracious, that means people are going to be sinning against you and need you to show them grace. Show them forgiveness. If, if God says you've got to be compassionate, that means you're going to have people with troubles around you, and, and you're going to need a big heart. You're going to need a lot of compassion to keep on listening to their troubles and to keep on helping them and to keep on caring about them. And if you're going to have to be righteous, well, that means you're going to have to keep making things right because the strong are going to keep taking advantage of the weak. And, and the psalm says, oh, you've got to be generous and lend freely. And later on, it says, you've got to freely scatter your gifts to the poor. Well, what does that tell you? All around you, if you'll only see them, there's going to be people in need, people in want, people lacking the fundamentals of life all around you. You're going to need to scatter your gifts. There'll be so many people who will need your help. And he says, about uh, five lines up from the bottom, huh? In the end, they will look in triumph on their foes. In other words, you're going to have foes. <laughs> They're going to have enemies. You're just trying to make the world a better place, and people are going to hate you for that, take you to court for that, battle you every step of the way. Their hearts are secure. Their hearts are steadfast. Why do they have to be? Because the opposition will be relentless and the obstacles will be many. Here, here is the kind of dad that God is going to bless. Here is the kind of dad that he's going to bless this guy's children. And I read a description like this and I find it kind of intimidating. I don't know about you. I'm having enough trouble being just the dad I am right now. I have enough trouble getting done the stuff I have to do right now. And here comes God, and he says, oh, i got all kinds of more things for you to do. I want you to be some kind of social justice warrior. I want you to be a crusader for the poor and the helpless. What? Wow. And I know it doesn't just Psalm 112 that talks that way. That's, Jesus talks that way. Remember Matthew chapter 25, the parable of the sheep and the goats. Who does he let into the kingdom of his father? Those who have helped the poor, right? The hungry, the imprisoned, the stranger, the sick. All the prophets, it seems, talk this way. Just one more example. Isaiah 58, verse 10. He says, spend yourselves. Not your money, right? Spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed. Lord, what if I feel like I'm already spent? I have enough, hard enough time being the kind of dad I am right now and you want me to be some kind of a super dad who's helping everybody who needs help. Oh, but this is the kind of dad God says he's going to bless. Bless how much, right? Him and his children, how much? So that whatever bad news comes, you will never have to be afraid of it. 
I'm not sure that I want that blessing. I'm not sure I want it. I think I want to trade it in. I think I want to say to God, no, no, God, just help me be the dad I am right now and get done the stuff I got to do right now and just don't send the bad news. <laughs> I don't want you to help me through it. Just don't send it. Because I've had some bad news. I've buried my daughter. I've buried my brother. I've spent weeks in the hospital with my baby. I've been downsized. I've had enemies. I've been through a tornado. I've been through a flood. I've sat with the grieving. I've helped the sheriff deputies deliver the news after horrible accidents. I've seen marriages disintegrate. And I just don't want any more bad news. I don't want God to say, here, I'll help you not be afraid. No, just don't send the stuff to begin with, please. Don't send any more for myself or my church or my children. Not anymore. Is that all right? Is that all right to talk that way to God? To say, can I, can I trade you, God, to give me a different promise? Is it all right to say to God, yeah, I read this psalm you put in the Bible, 112. It's a little bit too much for me, God. Is that all right? Oh, I know it isn't all right to make excuses. And I know it isn't all right to try to get out of caring more about other people. And maybe if I'm saying to God, God, I got enough to do already just, you know, being a dad and a pastor. I don't need all this other stuff, caring about everybody who's broken all around me. I don't know about that. Isn't that kind of like saying to God, God, I don't have time to care about other people who need caring. And then we're on dangerous ground, aren't we? Because when, when we... When we don't have time to show grace toward other people, that's a big sign that we maybe have forgotten how much grace God has shown to us. Or, or when, when we're just you know, too busy to feel compassion for the broken, doesn't that mean maybe our hearts haven't felt the touch of God's compassion toward us. And when, when, when God says, yeah, be generous, live a life of generosity, and that seems too much, it seems like too much, well, then maybe I don't know how generous God has been to me. Or maybe I don't care about right and wrong, and I don't care about hurting and oppression and suffering, and that's why I don't want to stick my neck out to, to create rightness in the world, huh? to, to be righteous, to work for justice, to help the downtrodden. Just a week or so ago, somebody was asking me for some money, and this is what I said. I said, you know, it's all right when you ask me for help every couple months. But lately, it's been every couple weeks. I'm a selfish person. I don't want to help you this time. That's what I said. Well, that sounds just like love your neighbor as yourself, doesn't it? Good job, Pastor Dirk. Very good. When, uh, when I get into my head that actually caring about other people the way Jesus cares about them is some kind of like a super dad. <laughs> I gotta think again, don't I? That's a dangerous way to think because it, is, it isn't a super dad to love other people the way Jesus loves them. That's a Christian dad. And I know that it isn't okay to make excuses about uh, Believe in God's big promises. Isn't that what Psalm 112 is? It's a huge promise from God, right? What does this promise say? You be this kind of man. You be this kind of dad who cares about the suffering and the oppressed, who delights in my commands, and I am going to fill 
your life with blessings. I'm going to fill your children's lives with blessings, with good things, with, with a steadfast heart, with happiness, with honor. I'm going to fill your life so full and, and all of the righteous things that you do, I'm going to make your righteousness endure. How long? Endure forever. Even if you scatter your gifts to the poor and you can't even remember who all you've been generous to, I will remember it and I will make sure all of your acts of righteousness really make a difference and really make things better for people for years and years to come. And I am going to be so good to you that whatever bad news comes into your life, it's going to seem like nothing compared to how much I fill up your life. That's what he's saying in Psalm 112. Such a huge, tremendous promise, right? And, and if I believed that promise, what would I say to God? Well, if it means that much to you, God, sign me up. Where do I go? Let's get at it, right? If I believe such a promise of God, the promise of God would transform me. It would change me. It would impel me. I would say, I got to be looking out for the kind of people God tells me to, to look out for and be helping them because God has attached such a tremendous promise to that. But because I don't really think much of God's promise, then I read a psalm like this and it just sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> sounds like a lot of work that isn't going to do anybody much good really in the end. And when I get to thinking like that, I don't need to ask God for a different promise. I need to ask him for a different heart. I need to repent and believe, actually believe what God says to me when he wants to make me a big promise. But what if, what if I really am just tired and afraid and a bothers me to think about the bad news that could be coming around the corner. And I just don't know how to do any more. And I just want to say to God, God, please, I don't know how to be like this person in Psalm 112. And if this is the kind of person I need to be to have your blessing or to have your blessing on my children, I don't think I'm ever going to get it. Then what? Then how is God going to respond to that, to me? And where can I find hope or comfort if that's where I'm at? Well, one of the places I find hope and comfort in this psalm, in Psalm 112, is in that phrase, gracious and compassionate. That's a description of how I'm supposed to be gracious and compassionate and righteous, but that phrase, gracious and compassionate, to the Bible reader in the time of the psalm writer, that they would have, oh, that reminds me of one of my favorite Bible passages. That's what they would have said. Because why does God ask me to be gracious and compassionate? Well, because he wants me to be like him. That's how he is. He's gracious and compassionate. That's the way he describes himself. You remember, maybe you remember Exodus chapter 34. This is where we get the song, Rock of Ages, cleft for me. Because God puts Moses in the cleft in the rock, right? And he says, I'm going to put my hand in there. And just through, through the cracks of my fingers, I'm going to let you see my glory. Because I'm going to walk past this crack in the rock. And as I walk past, I'm going to tell you my name. Remember that one? Exodus chapter 34, and, and God walks past in such glory that afterwards Moses' face is glowing, right? Such glory, and it's just, just a little bit of it to the cracks of God's fingers. And he says his name, and remember what he says? This is what he says. The Lord. The Lord. The compassionate 
and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness, maintaining love to thousands and forgiving wickedness, rebellion, and sin. One of the gems of the Old Testament of the Bible, Exodus 34, verses 6 and 7. How does God say? What's his name? He says, I'm the compassionate and gracious God. The very same words used here in Psalm 112 that I'm supposed to be. I'm supposed to be compassionate and gracious. Why? Because God wants me to be like him. Compassion means what? You feel sorry when you see somebody hurting. Grace means what? You just like doing nice, kind things for people, even if they are bad to you. And so I can come to God and expect to find compassion and grace. I can come to God as a selfish, self-absorbed, unloving, uncaring dad who sometimes wouldn't care if the whole world goes up in flames so long as I can have my own little corner of peace and quiet. I can come to God and I can say, God, do you have any blessing left for a dad like me? Or for my children? Because I certainly am not deserving of one. All I deserve is bad news and fear. Could you have any blessing left for me? And only because he is a compassionate and gracious God. He says, yes, I do. Yes, I do. I have a blessing even for you. I find comfort in that, even in this intimidating Psalm 112. I also find comfort thinking about that scene. You remember the scene of Jesus and the little children? Right? And, and, and what does Jesus do? Does he kind of uh, do a background check on those children before he picks them up? Does he say, uh, I'm only going to pick you up and bless you if you have a good daddy? <laughs> Can you tell me about your daddy? Does he help the poor? Right? Is that no? Jesus just picks them all up. He picks all those children up. He takes them all in his arms. He prays for all the children. He speaks a special blessing over every one of those children, no matter who their mother or father is or if they even have one, right? And I think about that for my children and think, well, then Jesus would love my children too and bless my children too, despite what kind of daddy they have. And I think about that precious, tender scene of my Savior Jesus with all the little children in his arms. And I think, yes, yes, in holy baptism, he put his blessing, his hands, his prayer over my children too. And his prayer, his blessing is mighty to keep all kinds of bad news away from them. One more place I find comfort as a father on Father's Day is, is just to think about what does that mean? What is the heart of a father? And the other night, it was three in the morning, and our baby had been crying all night, crying all night, and finally my wife had enough. I said, your turn, <laughs> right? So uh, after a while, I, I finally got our baby to go to sleep. And, uh, you know, that's the relief at 3 in the morning. And he was just so peaceful. And he had his little hands like this in my arms. looked like he was praying. And my heart it was just full of profound compassion for my little guy right at that moment. And I am to understand that's the heart of God toward me, right? Psalm 103, as a father has compassion on his children, so the Lord has compassion. As a father, the Lord has compassion. So when I stand before God and I have to say to God, I don't know how to be any better. I don't know how to do any more. And I'm not even doing the stuff I already have. And, and I'm just, I don't want you to say to me, God, I'll keep you from being afraid when the bad news comes. No, I don't want that. I just don't want you to even send the bad news. Just don't send it at all. 
when that's all that I can pray. God does not despise that prayer. The Father in heaven, the Father in heaven feels compassion like I do sometimes for my children. huh? And he takes even me in his arms and he helps me and he has a blessing even for me and for my children. Amen? Amen. The peace of God which goes beyond understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Please stand. Join me in uh, speaking first of all about our Father Almighty. We use the words of the Apostles' Creed, page 7 and 8. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty, From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You're welcome to remain standing for the next hymn. Please be seated. As we've been doing, we'll take the offering on your way out of church this morning.
my sister in Christ. Our Lord Jesus said to his disciples, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. In obedience to the Lord's command, you've been baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And you've been taught the precious truths of the Christian faith as confessed by the Evangelical Lutheran Church. You know that God has been very gracious to you. And you know the kind of life he wants you to live as a thank you to him. And you are ready for the privilege of receiving Jesus' own body and blood in the Holy Supper. You're here to make a public profession of your Christian faith. You've been waiting for a while, right? Till this virus got out of the way. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Christians in Rome, says, if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you confess and are saved. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved saved. Therefore, lift up your heart to the God of all grace and joyfully answer these questions. Do you this day in the presence of God and of this congregation acknowledge that in baptism, God gave you forgiveness of sins, life, and salvation? And answer, I do. Do you reject the devil along with all his lies and empty promises? And answer, I do. Do you believe in God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, as we just confessed in the Apostles' Creed? Then answer, I do. Do you believe all the books of the Bible to be the inspired word of God? Then answer, I do. And do you believe that the teaching of the Evangelical Lutheran Church, as you have learned to know it from Mr. Marquardt and from Luther's Catechism, is faithful and true to the word of God? Then answer, I do. Do you intend to continue steadfast in this teaching and to endure all things, even death, rather than fall away from it? Then answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. And do you intend faithfully to conform all your life to the teachings of God's word, to be faithful in the use of the word and sacrament and in faith and action? Remain true to God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as long as you live, then answer, I do, and I ask God to help me. Only God can help us do things like that, and so it's right for us to pray for you now. Let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, Heavenly Father, thank you. We praise you for your great goodness in bringing this daughter of yours to the knowledge of your son, Jesus Christ, and giving her both the heart to believe in him and a mouth to confess his saving name. We pray that you would enable, enable Octavia to bring forth the fruits of faith, to continue steadfast and victorious until the day comes when all who have fought the good fight of faith shall receive the crown of righteousness through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Ortavia, may God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, give you his Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and knowledge, the spirit of grace and prayer, the spirit of power and strength, the spirit of holiness and the fear of God. Amen. Your church now welcomes you to join us in the Lord's Supper, receiving Jesus' body and blood as a guarantee that we are loved by God and forgiven. Accept this invitation with holy joy and regard it as a privilege. Almighty and most merciful God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless and keep you. Welcome to Gardner Homes. Thank you. Yeah.
I don't think any special prayers have been requested this week. We can continue praying for recovery for Sherry Simmons. She's home. I spoke to her this week. She's glad to be home. Has a long way to go yet. We continue praying for John Allen Bromagam. Uh, as far as I know, his procedures all went fine. Yep, in Cleveland. Uh, praying for the grandmother of Rosalind Greer. And uh, if you don't mind, we pray also for my son Ezra. He was back in the hospital this week for two nights. Home, he's home again, doing a lot better, but uh, with a rough couple of days. Please stand and join me in prayer. Lord Jesus, our Savior, we, we know your heart went out to those you saw trapped in suffering or sickness, bound up by, by pain, crippled over. We know that you couldn't wait to, to make them better. And we pray that very same thing for our loved ones, for Sherby and John Allen and Rosalind's grandmother and for little Ezra, please, please uh, reach out your hand. Put your hands on these, our brothers and sisters, and uh, give them strength. Give them strength to heal, strength to serve you, strength to praise you even while they wait for the healing to be finished. Give patience and endurance to all those caring for them and give them all, if you would, a lot of good night's sleep. We pray for our country and our community that you would continue to work. Let your kingdom come among us and take charge of the hearts of the angered or the hurting or the confused or the afraid. Let your grace, your peace, your word take charge of all the hearts in our country that we may serve one another in the name, in the name of love, the love you showed at the cross. And we pray as you have taught us, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we commend to your care all the homes where your people live. Fill them with faith, virtue, knowledge, moderation, patience and godliness bind together in enduring affection those who have become one in marriage and let children and parents have full respect and affection for one another through Jesus Christ our Lord. O Lord our Heavenly Father almighty and everlasting God you have brought us safely to this new day defend us with your mighty power and grant that this day we neither fall into sin nor run into any kind of danger. And in all we do, direct us to what is right in your sight through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord. Amen. Let us praise the Lord. The Lord bless and keep you. The Lord's face ever shine upon you. The Lord grant you peace for all your days. Welcome to Stay Standing for our, our closing hymn.
be seated. I really treasure our time together. Thank you for being here. There's a good number of announcements in the uh, service folder. Bible class starting at nine this morning in the cafeteria. And then our service, so we recorded it and plan to have it up online uh, around 10 o'clock. So that's, some, that's another way that you can share what you've heard right you just hit literally here hit the share button and uh and maybe put a comment in there about hey you want to listen to this this is what it did for me technology gives us those ways to witness to our faith uh anything else mr marquardt anything else we gotta say today i hope uh, if you have a little time to greet ortavia and welcome her into our family give her a most hearty elbow bump or whatever you got and uh, God is good all the time, all the time.